Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I am here for my LCK week number five overview analysis. And of course, at the end, my updated power rankings. The LCK has been I, honestly, rather predictable across the entire year. There have been some interesting matchups and certainly some teams that have over or underperformed expectations, but there really haven't been a lot of teams that have, like, majorly upset what we all expected them to do in the preseason. Everything has kind of gone according to plan up until this point, and so we'll see if that changes at all in week number five. Of course, let me know down in the comments section below what you guys thought of week number five here in the LCK. Did anybody impress you? Did anybody not impress you? I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. Of course, some crazy stuff in terms of roster management and in terms of the players that did end up playing, which of course we'll cover in this, but we're gonna go ahead and go over every single thing because, of course, if you're new here, what we do is we go through all all 10 series that happened in week five in the LCK. We're going to be going through the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. I'll be giving a player of the series and a dud of the series for all 10 series across all five days. And then, of course, at the end of the video, I'll be updating my power rankings as well as giving my player of the week and my dud of the week. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into it. We've got a really, really kind of short week coming. Uh, spoiler alert, we had 10 series and we had 20 games. And so, you know, about as short of a week, in fact, as short of a week as is possible here in the LCK to cover. And we get to kick it off with day number one. And our first series of day number one was the Kwong Dong Freaks taking on D plus Kia. And DK is going to be able to pick up the 2-0 series win. They were definitely the better team in this series. You're going to hear me saying that phrase, I think, quite a bit as we go throughout this video. But this really was just a bit of a player diff. DK really starting to adapt, I think, to this new meta rather well, putting more aggressive picks into the mid lane, really giving Deft and Kellen a bot lane that they can succeed on in the early game and then transition that into dominance in the mid game and then putting Canyon on something that's going to be able to make some plays, whether that is, you know, the Ivern that we saw last week or, or now the Nautilus. Really, really interesting stuff, but player of the series, really easy choice for me. Going to go to Showmaker in the mid lane, who was phenomenal on two games of Tristana. You know, I've talked about this in previous videos, but... I think Tristana's just really, really strong right now. One of the strongest picks in the meta, in my opinion. And uh, I think Showmaker piloted her at a very, very high level. If you have a jungler that can play off of trying to set Tristana up to snowball the game out of control, I think it's actually a very difficult thing to stop, especially if you play something like an AP carry down in the bot lane. Kaisa's really good for that right now, but even something like the Ziggs, I think I, I would expect to see a rise in priority for across these patches as we continue to move on, just because I think AP bot laners are significantly more viable than people are giving them credit for at the current moment. But Showmaker's really, really good at this game, and he's been really good all split long. Like, I know people are a little bit lower on DK, and, you know, the consistency of this team hasn't necessarily been there. They're 500. They've lost some games that they really shouldn't lose, and they've, you know, won a lot of the games that they're supposed to win, and so they're not as impressive as I think you may think of them on paper, but Showmaker has not been the reason for that. He has been very good for this roster, and I think he continued to be good in this series. And then, of course, Deft and Kellen down in the bot lane. The hyper-consistent bot lane continues to be, you guessed it, hyper-consistent. They were really good in this series, consistently winning lane and then transitioning that into the mid-game, and Deft actually was doing a ton of damage on the Ash in game number two. That's a champion that we've actually seen a little bit of in pro play in a, in a couple other regions now with a lot of the hyperscaling ADCs being a little bit weakened. Obviously, the new meta kind of coming in. Ash is definitely something that's picking up priority, but honestly, we haven't really seen it be good yet. There's been a lot of losses for Ash across all of the regions, but not really a lot of wins, so... To see Deft pilot it and, and really do as much damage as he was able to do on a champion that isn't necessarily known for dealing a ridiculous amount of damage, that's really good. Milio is still incredibly strong, and Kellen was able to get it in game number two. And that was a big reason why I think the Ash was so effective. It's really crazy how much the Milio can do, but Deft and Kellen continue to be awesome, and they were by far the better bot lane here. There was a massive bot gap in this series which we'll get to when we talk about KDF. But Showmaker was good. Canyon pulled out two games of Nautilus Jungle. This is a pick, again, that we've seen, you know, pretty infrequently, but, you know, consistently over the course of this year. And it's been all right. It really hasn't been anything, like, sensational. It's been good enough. And then Kana on the Jacks in the top lane was good. Going into a player in Dudu who's having a phenomenal split, who I think is a very good player. Kana actually looked very solid in the laning phase, and I think did more than enough to be able to establish that. He's really not what I think a lot of Reddit wants him to be, which is this awful top laner that doesn't deserve to play for the team. So... 
DK looking pretty good. Uh, KDF on the other side, not so much. This is a team that I just moved into my top six, and I think justifiably so, but um, we kind of always talked about a top six in the LCK and then like a bottom four. I don't think that's necessarily the same as it was in spring. Obviously not because Live Sandbox isn't very good anymore, but I don't even think it's a top six anymore. I think it really is a top five and a bottom five in the LCK because I, as much as I like KDF, I really don't see them on the same level as the top five teams in the LP, in the LCK, and I think that, uh, that DK kind of proved that in this series. My debt of the series is going to go to Tyune in the bot lane for KDF. This KDF bot lane has just not been very good. There have been multiple times throughout the year that I've claimed that they're the worst bot lane in the LCK, and I think they're definitely in the running, and honestly, I think they're probably in the lead for that at the current moment. There have been games where they've looked relatively playable. Tyune has had moments where, you know, his early game isn't super bad, and he's able to team fight relatively even with the rest of the team, and he looks good doing so, but in most games, he's getting blown back so much in laning phase that it's almost impossible to get an accurate read of what he's able to do outside of that. I think he really is a massive weakness for a team that does have a good amount of talent on it. It's not like June's been a ton better. Both of these guys coming over from the DRX Challengers team last year, and it's just, it's not worked. They're not very good, and, and they're certainly not capable of playing up against players like Deft and Kellen, who are some of the best players in their roles in the entire world. So Taiyun and June continue to be a problem. Everybody else was okay. Like Bulldog and Dudu, the two main carries of this team were relatively fine. Dudu definitely got outclassed in the top lane by Kana, and Bulldog was worse than Showmaker, but Bulldog really wasn't all that bad in this series. Yung Jay had moments where he looked okay, but was also a little bit poor on the Maokai in game two. Overall, it's just like an okay performance from KDF. Not really all that shocking that they weren't able to keep up with DK, but I think that there are a lot of people that wanted this team to be like a potential, you know, dark horse in the playoffs kind of team. I just don't really see them like that at the moment. And then for DK, it's a nice win. It's an expected win, but it is one that you're going to be happy to get nonetheless, especially considering the current form. Being able to get back above 500 is a really good thing, and hopefully, you know, players like Showmaker are going to be able to keep this up because DK doesn't just want to be a good team. They want to be one of the best teams in the league. And even if they are maybe on world's pace at the current moment, it's not convincing. And, and that's definitely a concern. And then moving on to our second series of day number one. And we've already got what is probably the biggest upset of the LCK this split. Up until this point on day number one, we had DRX taken on T1. And DRX picks up the 2-0 series win. What the hell happened here? Like, what do I even talk about when it comes to this? I know people are kind of interested to hear me talk about this. I got some comments on the previous one about it, but what do you even want me to say? Like, this is a wild situation to even have happen in the first place. Obviously, there's a lot of analysis to give on potentials and, like, maybe this is happening, but I'm not in comms. I have no idea what's going on in terms of the infrastructure with this team. First of all, if you're out of the loop, first of all, wh who are you? How'd you get here? How do you not know? Faker's benched. Pa Faker is not, uh, he is not benched because of performance. He's had some issues uh, physically, and he's taken a little bit of a break. He should be back before playoffs which is really good for T1 because this was a disaster of a series. I mean, this was a nightmare for them. It felt like every single wheel fell off the car. Cars only have four wheels. Somehow 25 wheels fell off of this car. Uh, Poby comes in and is playing mid lane, utterly not ready for this. Like, I, even if you like Poby's uh, LCKCL tape, it's certainly not up to the point where you think he's going to be able to step into one of the best teams in the entire world and be able to keep up with that kind of pace with what Faker was able to do, a player who was an MVP finalist in the LCK for me in the previous split. So, you know, he's someone who you're going to have to be able to kind of try to integrate as quickly as possible and just get to the point where he's not going to be a problem for the team. But that means the rest of this team is going to have to step up. And you know what? They absolutely didn't in this game, and it was very concerning. But let's talk about DRX first and foremost, because holy crap, like DRX just beat T1. And that's pretty wild. This is a team that really has not been able to find any sort of consistency over the course of the year. Not that they've looked all that good at any, like, major point, but there have been moments that they've looked okay. Honestly, the past week was probably their best in 2023, and so that gave us some upside that maybe there was something left in the tank for this DRX team, but even I was not going to predict them to be able to take down T1, even Sans Faker, and so good performance from them. Player of the series for me is going to go to Fate in the mid lane. He was awesome last week as well. He feels completely rejuvenated ever since coming back in for DRX. Yehu, obviously, Obviously started the split in at the mid lane position. Fate just came back in with Juhan recently in that jungle mid position. And I think Fate has been genuinely phenomenal. Like a top four-ish mid laner in the league in the past week or so, which 
is not what I expected. That is certainly, it wasn't on my bingo card because he really wasn't all that good in spring. There was a reason he got benched in the first place. And so to see him play so well on both the Azir and especially on the LeBlanc in game number two, it's very impressive. Rascal had a really good series. He was just straight up better than Zeus here. We've been wanting Rascal to kind of get back into that form, you know, that, that we know Rascal can be at. Remember, go back to 2022 spring on this channel. I was talking about him as one of the best top laners in the entire world. And then, you know, fast forward to this split and I'm like, guys, Rascal's actively losing DRX games. And so, really good to see him pick up two games of Jax and just be, like, way better than Zeus, another one of the best top laners in the world right now, and that's really, really good. Paddock was awesome. The aggression absolutely paid off. I love these more early game-oriented ADCs for him. I think it helps him out a lot. Barrel was significantly more consistent, got to play as Heimerdinger, which was obviously a massive pick for him last year. And then Juan did a really good job setting up the rest of the team. Sejuani, his main pick, and he got to take it in game number one, and then actually pulled up the Nocturne in game two. We usually don't see him take these more aggressive assassin-oriented picks, but he looked good on it in the second game, and just generally DRX looked very cohesive as a unit. The solo laners were definitely the standouts, but all five members of DRX stepped up today, and they were honestly all better than their counterparts on T1. And as for T1, like, I don't know what to say. I really don't know what is going on. Again, I'm not in comms. I don't know what the shot-calling system is like, but this team really felt like a chicken with its head cut off in this, and I don't know if Faker is that head. It feels like it would be ludicrous to just give all of that to him. We know he's not the only communicator on this team. We know he's not the only game planner on this team, so to see him leave and then have everything fall apart, it's interesting. You know, I, this is one series, and so I don't want to overreact, but this was miserable. Dud of the series could go to quite a few people. I'm going to give it to Zeus in the top lane. It felt like he was most notably getting absolutely destroyed in this one by Rascal, but you could give this to Owner, who was really terrible on both the Maokai and the Wukong. You could give this to Karia, who had a really bad series on the Alistair and the Rel. I mean, Poby wasn't very good, but that one was more expected, right? There really was no positives to take away from this if you were T1. And that's scary. Like, that is very, very scary to deal with. And so hopefully there's something that you can build off of here because basically no one on this team played well and the macro was abysmal. And if that's the T1 that you're going to get until Faker comes back, like we could potentially be looking at a team that goes from being a one, two, three seed to being like the six seed or the five seed going into playoffs because this was a really bad team. Now, obviously once Faker comes back, I, you know, at worst, I expect it to be able to be fixed by then. But I mean, the, the momentum and the confidence that I have in a lot of these players is definitely, you know, on thin ice after this series. And it's going to be up to them to prove to me, maybe not this week because their opponent this week is, their other opponent this week is an absolute disaster for them, but maybe in future weeks with Poby that they can actually still play the game and still be able to pick up wins. So this was not a great first sign of, of life without Faker for T1. And then for DRX on the other side, like I said, big win. And honestly, they've looked a lot better in recent weeks. This is going to be a team that might be able to climb the power rankings a little bit. Again, I still think it's more of a bottom five than it is anything else. And DRX is not a team I'm going to expect to, you know, to compete for, you know, top six or whatever uh, as we move into the back half of the split. But it is good to see this team getting better as we move on. And it's nice to see a couple of the players come back in and play a little bit more rejuvenated. And then moving on now to day number two in week number five. And we kick day two off with a matchup between Nongshim Red Force and Hanwha Life Esports that Hanwha was able to pick up the 2-0 win in. And again, this is a pretty predictable outcome. Hanwha should be the better team out of these two. Nongshim has not really been able to pick up a ton of wins over the course of this split. Only one series win up until this point. And even if their bot lane has looked significantly improved in recent weeks, that doesn't mean that they are going to stay improved against one of the better bot laners in the entire world in Viper, and that was unfortunately the case for Nongshim here. They just couldn't hold up, and when their bot lane doesn't win, the rest of this team is absolutely not winning, and so let's go over a player of the series. No-brainer going to go to Viper in the bot lane. He's still so freaking good. He's been freaking good all year long. I don't think he's been the dominant, like, AFK number one bot laner in the world that, you know, some people on Reddit try to make him out to be. I would still take players like Ruler and Elk's season over Viper, but I think Viper has still been very good, and, and I think moving into the future, I think you could make a case that Viper, talent-wise, is still the number one AD carry in the world, just like he was last year on EDG, and this was a really good example of that. He got a lot of pressure in this series, and really, that's something new for him. This team hasn't invested a ton into the bot lane, at least in the early game. They invest a lot into the mid lane, typically for Zekka, or they invest a lot into the jungle to try to get Clid uh, rolling and, and moving, and most of the time, those can be okay solutions. Clid is very good in their wins, very bad in their losses. Zekka is rather consistent, but also just kind of a volatile player in and of itself. So Grizzly coming in, I think, and being more of a lane-oriented jungler actually helps Viper out a ton. This is exactly what happened 
when uh, Junjia, that's his name, uh, ended up coming in for EDG last year and uh, really started investing a lot more into bot lane. Obviously, Jeja picked that up and ended up continuing that trend when he was subbed back in. But very similar thing here with Grizzly, and we'll get to him in a second. This was his best series in the LCK by a gigantic margin. But Viper was the carry. Viper is the guy on Hanwha Life. If they're going to win a lot of games, it's probably going to be because of Viper. Now, Zekka is also really good, but again, he's pretty volatile, a pretty coin flippy player. He had a lot of coin flips today, and not all of them landed well, especially in that Yone game, and so it's really good that Viper stepped up. I thought Life had one of his better series in quite a while on the Nautilus, actually was setting up plays for Viper. He's been kind of poor over the course of this year, which was unexpected, I think, moving into the split. Life had been a very stable support over the course of his career up until this point, but it just didn't carry over to Hanwha. So to see him have a good series here, it's good, but I don't want to expect too much. But really, Grizzly, like, stepping up and having such a good series for Hanwha was really important for why they were able to take it. He was the second best player on Hanwha Life in this series, and that's very important. This is someone who I just thought wasn't ready moving into the split. Like, really, there was nothing else to say. He didn't really have a lot of time at the challenger's level. I didn't really think that he showed a ton while he was down there to make me believe that he could come into a team like Hanwha Life and immediately be a good enough jungler for their ambitions, but this was a sign that he can absolutely do that. I think his playstyle does fit this team a little bit better, and I think Viper is definitely happy to be receiving resources, so hopefully, if they can keep that up, this team could actually be relatively interesting. And then for Nongshim on the other side... And when their bot lane loses, they have absolutely no shot. Like, Jiwoo has been this team's best player, and I think that that's not even really all that up for debate. Vital was pretty good for this team before as well, but Jiwoo, I think, has really introduced a new life into Nongshim, even if they haven't been able to win series, and he got absolutely blasted in this series. He's going to get my dud of the series overall for Nongshim, just not going to be able to keep up with Viper. He was consistently targeted by Life and Grizzly in terms of engages, and then was taken down very, very quickly, and as soon as Nongshim lost him, they just had absolutely no shot of being able to win. Peter wasn't particularly really good either two games of engagers which at this point has just become the only support in the meta which I think is insane I still think enchanters are relatively good we saw how well Milio was doing but we're really only going to see engagers that's what supports want to play and so that's what they're going to play I know enchanters aren't very fun and you know if they're equally as good players are always going to lean towards engagers even if I do think that enchanters are now undervalued but um, I, the rest of this team just isn't very good like Fiesta coming back in has been okay like he was awful last split in spring got replaced by quad and then quad also wasn't very good so they just put Fiesta back in. He's whatever. He was okay in this series. Sylvie had an interesting series. He was at least trying to set up some plays for the rest of the team, but Din Din is bad in the top lane. He's the worst top laner in the LCK, and so there's really not a ton of upside here for Nongshim to me when bot lane isn't winning, and that was the case here. Jiwoo and Peter got absolutely demolished, and Nongshim fell. I'm, I'm not particularly surprised, and I, I really didn't expect anything else, but for Hanwha, it's a nice win. It's good to see them get back above 500, and again, just another one of the top five teams proving that they're a top five team. I don't exactly know where they rank amongst them. I'm still concerned about this team's upside against better teams, but for now, at the very least, they look good enough. And then moving on to our second series of the second day, and man, this was a, a, a little bit of a blowout, but in a weird kind of way. We had Liv Sandbox taking on Gen G, and to no one's surprise, Gen G is going to be able to take this series. They're able to take it two to nothing, as they absolutely should in this particular instance. But it just the way that it happened was not how I expected. This Sandbox team actually sucks. Like, they are not good at all. They're not even a competitive team, really, in a series like this. And that's got to be frustrating to Sandbox fans, because they were definitely a part of that top six in spring. And to see this team upgrade in the offseason, or, or presumably upgrade in the offseason, going from Envy to Teddy in the bot lane, and then just get significantly worse, it's very weird and very odd. But let's talk about Gen G first and foremost. Player of the series for me is going to go to Doran in the top. Lane. He's honestly been really good this split. I know people aren't going to bring him up nearly as much because Chovy and Pays have been dominant, and Peanut and Delight are also really good players that everybody knows are really, really good, but Doran, I think, honestly becomes the scapegoat for this team a lot more often than he deserves, even as someone who's been lower on Doran over the course of his career, someone who said he was the number three or number four top laner last year, right, and he wasn't, like, a guaranteed top two like a lot of other people were saying. Now I'm at the point where I think I'm high on him because I really do think that he should get votes for all pro this split, and he's probably not going to. He probably will by actual LCK voters, but, like, Reddit won't tell you that that's the case, and I think Doran's actually been really good, obviously, uh, 
very eclectic champion pool, likes to play these more aggressive picks, and certainly is more than happy to pull them out. Can be a little bit more of a tank player as well, does know how to play weak side, but the Gangplank in game number two is really what he's getting this player of the series for. Always fun to see GP back in the meta. One of the more fun top laners, in my opinion, to watch in pro, because the skill execution on it in late game team fights is really just so high. You can really separate the good and the great GP players from each other in pro, and I think Doran really showed that he's one of the better GP players in this one, but the Quinn in game number one was also a lot of fun. We've seen that as the counter pick to Renekton for many years in the LPL, so good stuff there. The rest of this team was also awesome. Chobi was lights out in game number one. I mean, the, uh, he couldn't miss a charm if he, even if he wanted to. I talk about point and click in terms of what RE charms can look like on some of the best players in the world, but Chobi was threading the needle in so many different opportunities to land it on priority targets. It was just so impressive. It's Chobi. I mean, what do you really want me to say? He's super good. He's an MVP candidate, and potentially the MVP frontrunner right now got 20 kills in this series in pays. Two games of Kai'Sa, really, really good. 12 and 8, I think, uh, a piece in terms of kills. Really good series overall from him. Usually that would land him a player of the series, but honestly, he, he was kind of, I don't want to say gifted a lot of those kills, but he didn't really have to do all that much. The rest of the team was just super far ahead, and Gen G was just winning everywhere. Like, he still was way better than his opponents, but Gen G was just kind of dominating, and those those 20 kills came relatively easy for him in this series. So, overall, Gen G continues to look utterly fantastic. They look like one of the best teams in the entire world. They continue to stay undefeated, and and really almost everybody on this team is an all-pro candidate. And then for uh, Sandbox on the other side, man, they suck. Like, I don't know how we got here. I don't know how we got to the point where Sandbox was, like, not playable. Like, where they're, like, a bottom one, bottom two team in the LCK. And I don't want to overreact again because it's Gen G, and Gen G absolutely blasts people. But this Sandbox team can't buy a win at the current moment. Dead of the series for me is going to go to Bertle in the top lane. Talked about how Doran was phenomenal on that side for Gen G. Bertle was a disaster on that side for Sandbox. And there's going to be a lot of, like, history revisionists out there that are like, Bertle has never been good. You know, this is just normal. You know, last split, Bertle was also garbage. He just got carried by the rest of this team. And that is exactly what I said it was. It's it's revisionist history. It's not real. Bertle was really good last split. He really stepped up his game. It was his best split in the LCK, in my opinion. By a long shot, he led in almost every single statistical category, and he backed it up with the film. Like, if you watch the games, you were constantly noticing him making good play after good play in team fights. He was really good in lane. He was really good out of lane. And it's just all fallen apart this split. He's been a disaster in summer, and I have no idea what the difference was, right? Like, what was the difference between Damwon, Bertle, and Spring Live Sandbox Bertle that made him good? And then what was the difference between Spring Live Sandbox and Summer Live Sandbox Bertle that made him bad again? Like, I don't know. I don't know what the inconsistency is coming from, but he was miserable in this series. But it's not just him. It's everybody on this team. Kale, one of my favorite supports in the entire world, somebody who has shown to make basically everybody he's played with in the bot lane better, has been awful this split. And I don't know why. Like, I can't explain explain to you why his engages are so bad. I can't explain to you why his early laning phase has suffered so much. This is something that he's always been very good at, and now he's just not. So I don't know. Willer has regressed a lot. Closer's always been someone that I've been lower on, but he's having a very bad split. I think a lot of people are seeing Teddy as like the surviving member, like the, the guy who's ELO held on this team, but he's been really bad in the past two series. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Sandbox. It feels like this team is either just completely mental boomed or everybody just forgot how to play League. Whatever it is, they need to figure it out fast because not only is this team in danger of like missing playoffs like this could be the worst team in the LCK if they continue to play like this and then for Gen G this is the best team in the LCK and it's by a lot like KT Rolster is a lot of fun to watch at the current moment but Gen G really is the team to beat and they will continue to be the team to beat they have three or two I should say of the biggest MVP favorites in the entire league and then also Peanut, Delight, and Doran which is absolutely absurd Gen G is looking phenomenal and basically as good as you could have wanted and then moving on to day number three now, and we get to kick day three off with one matchup that we're going to talk about multiple times in today's video. We had OK Breon taking on KT Rolster, and KT does pick up the 2-0 series win. Really nice to see them continue to play at a very high level. This team has been very consistent over the past few weeks, which is very rare for KT Rolster as an organization, so it's been very, very fun to see. A lot of these players are just playing at a really high level, and honestly, so many of them have fantastic synergy with the rest of the team that it's pretty astounding. Like, I, I could never have imagined this team working together as well as they have over the course of this year, but basically everything you could have asked for for this team has clicked into place, and they're going to be able to beat a team like Bro, who, yes, is okay, but they're certainly not phenomenal, and I didn't even mean the pun was not intended. I didn't even realize it until after I said it, but, um... Yeah, I mean, they're they're all right, but they're not, like, great, right? They're a bottom three-ish team in the league, maybe four now with Liv Sandbox joining that 
equation, but KT Rolster is fantastic, and, and, and they're really, really good. So let's talk about it. Player of the series for me is going to go to Aiming in the bot lane. This is actually his first player of the series of the entire split, which is crazy to me because he has played relatively well, but when you look at KT Rolster, it's really been like a lot of everyone else. Like, not that Aiming has been bad, but he really has not been the focal point for what KT has wanted to do. It's been a lot of Keen in the top lane. It's been a lot of BDD in the mid lane, and it's been a lot of Lehens in the support position that have been getting a lot of the recognition, rightfully so. They're very good players, but Aiming has also been very stable for this team, and I think this is a role that fits him incredibly well. Somebody who can just play these late game hyper carries, somebody who doesn't have to worry too much about the early game, he doesn't have to worry about getting behind, he doesn't have to worry about, you know, overreaching himself, because he can put himself in bad positions. His positioning has definitely gotten him into trouble before when he feels like he has to win the game on his own, which is sometimes, you know, the role and the job of the AD carry. However, I think on a team where you've got a really strong topside and you've got a support who's super aggro in his own right... Like, it absolutely could work. And so, for KT Rolster, I think aiming, you know, playing like he has this split has actually been a major positive, and I think he's been very good for them. Everybody else was also good. The solo laners were both really positive in game number two. Keen was really good on the Renekton. BDD was really good on the Vigar. Whoever you end up wanting to give player of the game in game number two to, I understand. Keen dominated lane a little bit more, I would say, than what BDD did, but I think BDD was a little bit more impactful in the teamfight stage of the game. So, either is really fine. Seeing Vigar in general and pro is sickening to me, but still... You you know, <laughs> despite that, BDD, I think, played really well. Cuz continues to be a major positive factor. He has completely found his groove back. Basically, every negative trait that I was giving him last year is gone now. His consistency has improved a lot. He's not making a lot of the boneheaded mid-game decisions that he was last year, where it just felt like he was trying to do too much or not doing enough. It really didn't feel like he knew exactly what he needed to do in the mid-game to spread any sort of lead that he got in the early game, but he's cleaned that up a whole ton, and we all know how good Lehens is in the support position. This team is very complete. They're very strong right now. And then for bro on the other side, they're just all right. Like they're, they're not, they're not all that good of a team. I know people really like them. And I know that they're very popular amongst the community because the memes are very funny when it comes to bro. And when it comes to Morgan and just everything kind of surrounding it, but they're just like a, a mediocrely bad team, right? They're a low tier team. And, and that's, there's really not all that much to talk about when it comes to them. Dud of the series is going to go to umpty in the jungle. I know people are still trying to hang on to the idea that umpty is a good jungler at the LCK level. I, I'm not, you know, I've talked about this in previous weeks. I'm out on umpty. I, I just, I haven't seen it. Uh, he has one or two really good games and sometimes a good week every single split. And people are like, this is the MT I remember. And then every other week is like really bad, like really, really bad. And that kind of inconsistency is just enough for me to say that I don't think I'd want him on the team. I, I, I think that, you know, obviously there is some upside there. There are going to be some games where he looks good, but the games where he looks bad are just way, way more. There's way more of those. And that's a little bit of a problem. He was bad in this series. Morgan wasn't particularly good on two games of Cassante in the top lane. Karis can, you know, he was all right last week coming back in to this lineup for Ivory. I thought he was better than Ivory, and so right call, I think, to stick with Karis, but it's not like he's a game changer or anything like that going into a player like BDD. And then Henna and Effort are just whatever, right? Like, Henna's a tier above, I would say, the worst bot laners in the league, but certainly a tier below a lot of the good bot laners in the league. And so just kind of in his own little little world there as a player who can kind of play at this level, but certainly isn't going to make you feel entirely comfortable going into some of the better bot lanes in the entire world, which is what the LCK has. So bro's fine. They are what they are, and we, we we kind of knew that going into the split, but KT Rolster is looking really, really good. This is a really fun team to watch, and honestly, they are more than the sum of their parts, and the sum of their parts are already pretty freaking good, and I think that just shows, that should just go to show you how good KT Rolster is. The upside of this team is like top one, top two in the entire world, and they're getting closer to that, you know, reality than I think most of us thought possible at the beginning part of the year. And then moving on to our second series of day number three here, and it's another one that was quite dominant, I will say, as we had D plus Kia taking on DRX, and DK is going to be able to pick up another 2-0 win. That's a 4-0 week for them, and that's pretty darn good. A lot of people were starting to question the validity of this team and of what they were going to be able to do as the year moved on, and I'm not going to say that those questions are completely answered now, but wins against KDF and DRX, two of the teams that have looked, I don't want to say better out of the bottom tier, but at least like recently more competent out of the bottom tier, and in as dominant fashion as they were able to do it, is impressive, and it's really good to see. Good for DK to be able to come out, and good for 
for Canyon in particular, who really stepped up. But for DRX to go from the whiplash of absolutely demolishing T1, who, you know, was the, the odds-on favor to be the best team in the entire league going into the split, and then getting absolutely blasted by D plus Kia, it's got to be a little bit disheartening, but, you know, we'll talk about them in just a second. For DK on their side, player of the series, no-brainer for me, is going to go to Canyon in the jungle. That Nico, man, it is so fun to watch him play Nico. There are very few players in the world that are just, like, meant to play a champion. I feel like Canyon just plays Nico at a level where it's like, yes, only play this, actually. I would really prefer if you only ever played this champion. I know not every comp is going to be able to pull off Nico, and Nico's not one of those picks that you should just blind pick every single game or anything like that. But it's so fun to watch Canyon play Nico. Like, he plays it at such a high level, and it's really, really great. He got to play Lee Sin as well, also. You know, Canyon, Lee Sin, pretty damn good uh, for that, for my money in that game as well. And so, Canyon, pretty easy choice for player of the series. Really good to see him bounce back. He really hasn't been all that consistent in summer, but that's pretty traditional for him in the regular season at this point. We were saying the same exact thing about him last year in summer as well, and then he had a fantastic Worlds, and everybody just kind of forgot. And so, for Canyon, I think he's going to be just fine. This was a series that shows that Canyon's definitely still in there. But the rest of this team was also great. Showmaker and Deft both go deathless in this one. Deft with the ultimate, like, BM decision. And that's to play Barrel's, like, DRX Ash skin that he won winning Worlds with him last year. And then to kill him, like, a billion times in the series on it. Like, that's one of the most unbelievable things that I've seen. Deft was specifically looking for Barrel in these games. And you can tell because he's wearing his skin and, and he's absolutely chasing him down. And Barrel did not have a fun time in this series. That I will definitely be entirely honest with you about. And so, very, very funny series for him. Deft. I almost wanted to give him player of the series just for that because the mental like damage that he is doing uh, between these two teams is absolutely immense. Kellen, for that matter, was also great. 0-4 and 34 across two games is absurd, mostly on that rel, which was a fantastic game. And then Showmaker also deathless, like I said, not nearly as influential as he was in the first series, but still really good. Kana was really good on the top side, definitely better than Rascal. Overall, just a really good series from DK. They are by far the better team in this one. And then DRX, like, I, I don't know what happened in the T1 series. I, again, I'm not going to try to speculate. T1 could be way worse than we all think without Faker, but whatever happened to DRX on that day that powered them up, it left their body before this series. That I can definitely tell you. Barrel's gonna get done in the series. It felt like he was actively trying to die to his own skin. This game, so many, so many engages from the Nautilus and the Alistair directly on top of the Ash, only for him to get slowly peeled off and then killed. And it's like, okay, at some point, like at some point, you would learn to not do that anymore. But he never stopped going in, so... I guess there's that. Paddock, for his credit, was also not very good in this one. Was certainly not trading back damage. His laning phases, in particular, were really bad. And honestly, that's a trend for him as a player. His laning has been pretty awful. He's a really, really crazy team fighter. Not always in a good way. Like, he's just kind of insane. He'll step up and try to front line. But sometimes it does end up working out. But the lane phase has really never been a positive for these two in the bot lane. And that definitely continued here. Rascal was miserable in the top lane, got absolutely destroyed, basically in both matchups by Kana, specifically by that LeBlanc in game number one, which is just a wild pick in the first place, and then Juhan had no pressure the entire series. Like I said, Canyon was just dominating the entire series, and it felt like Juhan was a little bit of a ward for his team. So overall, DRX, whatever they happened, whatever they had happened to them in that T1 series, it certainly was not going to last, but credit to DK, this was a really good week for them. The 4-0 has got to be an incredibly exciting thing for them overall, and hopefully they're going to be able to bring a lot of this momentum and confidence into the rest of the split and not just revert back like they've done a couple of times this year. And then moving on now to day number four in week number five, and we get a matchup that I think on paper, obviously, people were really excited to see, but maybe an execution isn't quite as great as once expected. We had T1 taking on Gen G, and Gen G is going to be able to pick up the 2 0 series win. At one point, we were considering these two of the best teams in the entire world, especially going into MSI and, you know, coming out of the LCK. These year two finalists from last split, but Gen G has kept up that pace. T1, obviously, not so much. Poby coming in has completely thrown the rest of this team for a loop and I don't know what happened to this team this week but they completely crumbled and they completely collapsed because this was a pitiful performance coming in from T1 but let's talk about Gen G first and foremost they're just so good they're so clearly in my opinion the best team in the LCK at the current moment obviously KT Rolster looks really good and we'll talk about them a bit more you know in just a second after this one but um, Gen G for now you know since they beat KT the first time around they're just so so clearly the best best team in the LCK. It's those two and then everybody else is a steep decline in my opinion and I really think it's the entire team for Genji that has stepped up. Obviously I'm kind of going to draw back to what I've talked about earlier in the week for them because I think it's a very similar argument but player of the series for me is going to go to Doran in the top lane and 
If you thought his GP and his Quinn earlier, his fun picks, were a blast and that he was going to be able to, you know, maybe not do that against some of the best teams, but he was going to look good against the bad teams, well, here's your Renekton and Jax. Here's your meta top laners, and here's him dominating Zeus on them. And that's really impressive for me. Obviously, Zeus hasn't been the most consistent of top laners in the world, but still, being able to get this kind of performance out of Doran, I think, is really, really, really big for this team because we know that the core middle of this team of Peanut, Chovy, and Pays is going to be great, and Delight is certainly never going to be a hindrance for this team, even if I don't think that if you took him off of this team and put him on an average team, he would be, like, phenomenal. I, I think that with Pays in particular, they've developed such an amazing chemistry as a duo, and they play really well together, and Delight, I think, plays with Peanut and Chovy very well in that same manner. Like, the only question about this team was whether or not Doran could hold up to some of the best top laners in the world, and this is a really good indication that the answer to that question is absolutely yes. I honestly do believe that Doran is currently in the midst of the best split of his entire career. And I know some people are going to, you know, be a little bit contentious on that opinion, but I really do think this is the best that Doran has ever looked. And I'm really hoping he's going to be able to keep it up because this was awesome from him in this one. Obviously, the rest of the team was also great. A lot of credit over to Pays, who just continues to be phenomenal. Probably the MVP frontrunner in the LCK at the moment. Delight was sensational on two games of Rakan. Consistently phenomenal engages. Had way more pressure both in and out of lane than Caria on the other side of the map, who we'll talk about. Chovy was great. Peanut is everywhere on the map. This team is just so complete. Everything that they do is just everything you could ask for from one of the top teams in the entire world. Now, obviously, you're hoping that they're going to be able to compete at that level. They weren't necessarily able to do that at MSI, but in my opinion, this team is better now than they were at MSI. I think they have gotten consistently better over the course of the year, and I'm hoping that that's going to be able to stick. And then for T1 on the other side... God, I just don't know what to do with this team at the current moment because this is bad. Like, the 0-4 week is not good for them, and they're sitting at 6-4 and four in the standings. If Faker is out for, like, an extended period of time, if he's out two, three more weeks, like, that's a problem for T1, not because, oh, they might miss the playoffs. I have a feeling they're probably going to be able to figure it out at the very least to make the playoffs, right? But you don't want to go into the playoffs as a 5 or a 6 seed, and this team is kind of looking like they're in that zone right now. Dud of the series for me is going to go to Owner in the jungle. He was out jungled in every single game that he played this week. His pathing was horrendous, and I can't imagine that Faker was making his pathing decisions for him in the early game, so... I, like, I, I can't blame this all on Faker leaving, right? Like, this is all not just Faker left, uh, insert he shot caller joke here, left, right? It can't all be that because there are individual micro decisions and individual mechanical problems that this team had in this series that, you know, would, would have happened with or without Faker. And so I don't know what's going on, but Owner was miserable on both Lee Sin and the Vi in this series, could not keep up with Peanut really at all. Zeus got absolutely dominated in the top lane. He would have a couple of really good plays. He would actually be in a relatively decent lane state, and then he would throw it away by just being wildly over-aggressive and out of position in one particular moment, and then all of a sudden that lead that he was able to generate is just gone. Poby is clearly not ready to play in the LCK. You know, I don't even think he really was, like, all that bad, but, like, come on, dude. It's his, He's 17 years old. It's his second LCK series, and now he's got to go up against Chovy. Like, come on. It's not going to happen. It's just simply not going to happen. And then Guma and Karia weren't very good either. It's very rare that I talk about a team in such a negative way, but I really genuinely believe there are no positive takeaways for T1 across the entirety of week number five. I don't think there's a single thing that you can look at from this week and say, well, at least this happened. The closest I can get is, well, at least Gumayushi only had eight deaths across two series. Like, that's the closest that we're getting because no one played well, there were no bright spots, and there's nothing to look forward to. And so you got to hope, I don't know, Faker comes back soon or this team figures out how to play without him because whatever's going on right now is, is not sustainable to the point where I think it genuinely might cost them, you know, actually being able to get to Worlds if things go that poorly. And then for Gen G on the other side of the map, like, they're the best team in the LCK. There really is not much else to say. Obviously, there are going to be teams that try to contest them, but for for now, they're the Kings. And then moving on to our second series of day number four here, and it is, I guess, an upset. Not really at this point, to be quite honest. We had Nongshim Red Force taking on Live Sandbox, and Nongshim Red Force is going to take this series 2-0. to zero. It's only their second series win of the entire split, and Live Sandbox has officially completed its uh, catastrophe uh, of a slide down the standings 
basically to last place. I mean, this team has gone from, oh, you know, they probably should be a playoff team. They were a playoff team last split. They only got better to, okay, well, they had a really stu a tough early start to the split. They had a really tough schedule, and they played all the good teams early to now it's like, okay, this team sucks. They're not very good. We're going into the second round Robin, and they might be the single worst team in the LCK, and that's really where we're at at this point. We'll talk about them in a second, but congratulations to Nongshim again. This is just a team that plays really hard. I know that's a weird way to say it when it comes to, like, esports as opposed to traditional sports. That's kind of a saying that, you know, doesn't exactly work as well when you translate it to esports, but this is just a team that plays really hard. They go out there and they try to skill check you, and they're either ahead by 15 minutes, and they have a shot to be able to close out the game, or, or they've kind of run it down, and they're going to have fun either way, and it's a lot of fun to watch, I think, as a viewer. It's not always the most conducive to winning, which is why I haven't necessarily ever really put a lot of expectations on this Nongshim team, you know, in the past couple of, you know, months or whatever, ever since we realized that this is what they were going to be, but man, are they, are they good, like, mechanically, like, they know how to play the game, they just can't really seem to put all the pieces together, but when they're able to get those leads, they're able to do a lot with them, which is what they did in this series. Player of the series for me is going to go to Jiwoo in the bot lane. Man, this guy is good. He really is by far my, the best player on Nongshim. I don't even think it's really all that close at this point. The fact that he hasn't been starting all year, like, yeah, I get it. Vital is kind of interesting. He's pretty good. He's been okay. He's honestly been maybe the best player on Nongshim before this over the course of this year, but Jiwoo has been such a breath of life. For a team that really felt like it had none over the course of this split, that it, it just makes you wonder what their decision-making process was. These were the five players that played together in the Challengers League. The reason that this team got promoted, they were the best Challengers League team, and there was a reason that there was a lot of hype around them, and Jiwoo wasn't getting that opportunity with the rest of them, but he's finally getting it now, and he's absolutely proving that he deserved to be here all along. Are there some mistakes? Absolutely. At seven deaths, he led his team by far in deaths. A lot of those were the enemy team, Sandbox, burning everything to try and kill him just to maybe win a fight, but using everything and therefore losing the fight. But, you know, some of them were him being over-aggressive, stepping forward when he doesn't really need to, trying to be the hero in a situation where he can just kind of play AD carry, right? Which, it's going to happen with some young players. You're going to be able to get over that. But his ability to outplay his opponents is actually extraordinary, and I think he's a big asset towards his team. The other player that you got to shout out, Sylvie in the jungle. Talk about a great series. This might be a single best series in the LCK ever since he was promoted this past split. Um, I think that Sylvie was a player that obviously we all kind of saw a bunch of potential in. In the Challengers League, the dude absolutely dominated. Both him and Fiesta were basically an unstoppable jungle mid duo down in Tier 2, but things have not translated all that well to the main roster. Going into Willer, a, a pretty decent jungler, one who, yes, is having a pretty poor split for his standards, but Sylvie really, really outperformed him here. The Poppy was great, the Kha'Zix was great, everything was working for him, and those are the two players that I really want to highlight. Sylvie and Jiwoo as the two players that really stood out in this series as being great. Peter had some really good engages, Fiesta was certainly more of a positive, and this was awesome for Din Din. Going into a player in clear, who we'll talk about in a second, was subbing in here, but a lot of people have crazy high expectations for a player like clear, so to see everybody on Nongshim win and look really good, it's just a massive positive for this team, and hopefully a confidence builder. And then for Sandbox on the other side, it's Disaster. Like, Disaster has officially struck. There's nothing else to say. They might be the single worst team in the LCK at the moment. 0-4 this week. They dropped to 2-8. and That's the same record as, you guessed it, the two worst teams in the entire league. And really, it's deserved. It's earned. They haven't been able to beat anybody over the last month of the split. And all of their players have looked bad. Clear was subbing in here for Bertle, who was miserable early on in the week. Clear, this massive prospect who everybody was like, why is DRX getting rid of him? Is he going to go to Europe and start for an LEC team or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It ended up just being, okay, well, I'm going to go to Sandbox. I'm going to play in Challengers League. And, you know, now an opportunity has arisen. He wasn't particularly good in this series. His laning was really bad. Dindin was just straight up better than him in a lot of laning phases. And Dindin hasn't done that to anybody in the LCK. Willer's dud of the series for getting completely out jungled in every single game. Closer made some abundant errors on two of his more famous picks here in the Yone and the LeBlanc. Teddy, I think, was relatively okay. Kale, I also think, was relatively okay. But Sandbox, in general, just can't buy a win. They don't know how to generate leads. They don't know how to generate advantages. They play the map very poorly. And they're mechanically really suffering right now because of their confidence. And so I think Sandbox is only going to continue to slide, especially if this team continues to play like this. I think Jungle Mid is in a really bad spot. A lot of people are saying Teddy is ELO held, like I said before. I think Teddy has had, you know, good performances, certainly not great performances on this team. Certainly not someone who I think would be able to carry a team across a finish line. That's not what Teddy has been for this team, but 
the rest of the team absolutely does need to step up. If Sandbox wants to be anywhere near the playoffs, which I'm sure they have expectations of doing, they got to get their ass into gear now. The split is going much faster than I think they're anticipating, and they're going to get left behind if they're not careful. But for Nongshim on the other side, really, really good win. They're going to be very excited to be able to pick up the second one of the split. Um, just getting some confidence behind some of these young players and figure out, figuring out who you want to move with moving forward. I think it's a really good, really good, nice thing for this organization, and I think the series definitely helped them with that. Now we get to jump into our fifth and final day of LCK action here in week number five, and we get to kick off that fifth and final day with a matchup that might look a little familiar. We have KT Rolster taking on OK Breon. Hey, wait, didn't we already see this earlier on in the week? Yes, yes, we did, but the round robin's rolling over. Of course, every team plays each other twice in the regular season, which means sometimes we get matchups like this twice in the same week. And so I believe this is the only time that's going to happen this split. I think obviously it's the only time it's going to happen this split. Everybody's already played each other once, so they can't play each other again in the same week. So we get KT Bro twice, and KT is able to take the 2-0 again. It's a 4-0 week for KT, and they beat Bro four times. Bro played four games this week and lost all four of them to KT Rolster. Feels pretty unfortunate to be, you know, Bro in this circumstance, and pretty weird to be KT where you got a bunch of wins, but it was all from, like, one of the worst teams in the league. So kind of a weird situation, but good for KT. Guess who played well again? Aiming in the bot lane. He continues to brutalize Henna and Effort. In terms of that bot lane matchup, he's going to be my player of the series for a second time this week against the same team. It looks like he's going to get all of his good games out against Breon, which, sure, whatever. You know, if you want to do that, if you want to go and destroy Bro over and over again, go do that, Aiming. That's that's your prerogative. You can go have fun with that. Lehens was also great on the Nautilus, on the Alistair, but this bot lane stepping up is a really big deal for KT overall because we know BDD is going to be fine. We know Keen's going to be fine. Cuz has been in really good form. If Aiming can step up and legitimately be like a top, you know, I don't know, 6, 7, 8-ish ADC, in the world somewhere around there just like a top 10 AD carry in the world I think this team is like a genuine world contender right like this is a world championship contender if everything can click and we kind of already knew that we already knew that they were a top four you know five-ish team in the world but they could be better than that that's kind of what I'm saying here is the upside is higher than that when aiming is playing well now Yes, it's against Henna and Effort, so I really don't want to overreact. I really don't want to sit here and tell you that this is definitely... It, this is what's going to happen against the best teams in the world. They're going to destroy Genji in the finals, and they're going to go on and win the world championship. Like, I'm, I'm not telling you that that's what's going to happen, but aiming stepping up is a really big piece of that puzzle, and I think that we got really good confirmation that, at the very least, that's going to be a possibility here. Lehens continues to be really good in the support position. There are just very few supports in the world that play with the same level of controlled chaos that Lehens does. I, I don't want to say chaos because players like On are very chaotic. Like, they're going to go out and, and really risk the game on a lot of aggressive plays. And Lehens is kind of similar, but he does it in a much more controlled way. He's very similar in terms of the game-to-game -game variance of how he ends up going about it. He almost always does it in lane as opposed to, you know, around the map. He's always going to try and enable his AD carry first and then start to move to the rest of the team. But um, he does it in a way where I think it translates a little bit better into the mid-game rather than it just being this big, like, flurry and array of aggressive plays that either you match or you lose, right? Like, that's kind of how on plays. Not that that's a problem. That can generate even bigger leads. But Lehens, I think, is a little bit more controlled in how he executes on that aggression, and I think it actually helps this team out a lot. Obviously, Keen is still really freaking good in the top lane. BDD had a phenomenal series. He was really, really good on both the Nico and the Azir, almost an underrated one. The scoreline doesn't necessarily tell the tale of just how good he was for a lot of these games. And Cuz has been basically perfect. He pulled out the Skarner in game number two, which is always a blast, and he really looked awesome on it. This team just feels like they're flexing on everybody now, and it was really good. Now, there were some problems. The early games were very questionable from this team, but being able to rally around mid-games is something that the best teams in the world do incredibly consistently, and that's what KT was able to do in this series. So, uh, positives to take away, I would say, in general. And then for Bro on the other side, again, there are positives. Uh, you had some good early games, and, and that's really tough to do. I think Morgan, in particular, really did a great job of winning lane against Keen, which is certainly not a an easy thing to do. Not that Keen got destroyed or anything, but playing Jax into Renekton is not always the easiest matchup for Jax in the early game, especially if you're going into a really good Renekton player like Keen. But Morgan was actually really solid in this matchup. He probably knows it inside and out being a Renekton player himself, but really, really good stuff from him. And honestly, everybody on the team had some good early games. Umpty's pathing was pretty good in this series. He wasn't able to generate gigantic leads for himself, but he put his laners in good positions. Karis, Henna, Effort, they were relatively fine in the early game. This team just has absolutely no idea 
what to do in the mid game. They have absolutely no function of it. And that's what we've been saying. The bottom teams in the LCK, they're all kind of the same story. Nongshim, bro, KDF to a lesser extent because I think their early games are just like way more consistent. But like they, none of them know what to do in the mid game and none of them have figured out what to do in the mid game. And it's kind of frustrating to watch, but also I think it's just like natural selection, right? If a team is going to be bad in the mid game, they're going to be near the bottom of the standings and the teams that are good in the mid game are going to be near the top of the standings. I think this series was a good encapsulation of that. Henna is going to get my dud of the series because his team fighting was just absolutely horrendous in this series, but he was a pretty decent laner, especially on that Zaya in game number two, but it just wasn't going to be enough. You need to be able to actually capitalize on some of the leads that you were able to build, and it just felt like Bro was consistently out of position and not ready for a lot of the plays that KT wanted to make to try to get themselves back in the game. It's something that they can fix. I just don't know if they're going to, but Bro is still a bottom tier team. They went 0-4 this week, and I know it was to KT Rolster, but it is still worth pointing out that they didn't play particularly well outside of, you know, the first 10 minutes in a couple of games, and so... I still think they're exactly who we thought they were. My opinions of them really haven't changed, and that's basically the same thing for KT. This is still one of the best teams in the world. They're still very good, and they're still very consistent. Hopefully, they're going to be able to keep it up. And that's going to bring us to our final series of the week here in our second series of day number five, as we had the Kwong Dong Freaks take it on Hanwha Life Esports. And HLE is going to be able to pick up the win and the 2-0 and... Like I said at the beginning of the video, I wasn't lying. It was a 2-0 for every single series this week in the LCK. That's got to be one of the first times that's ever happened, if not the first time that has ever happened, because that's absolutely nuts that that would happen at all. And so, pretty insane. 10, uh, 10 series, 20 games. And so, a uh, very, very concise week, but good for Hanwha Life to be able to pick up the final win. This team honestly does look relatively good right now. Maybe not perfect, but still relatively good. Certainly better than they did in that first week with Grizzly, where it was looking incredibly contentious, whether or not he was actually going to be able to play in the LCK at all. And so, I would say good stuff for this team overall. My player of the series. A lot of people are going to give this one to Viper. I'm going to give it to Kingen in the the top lane, who I actually thought was phenomenal. The Jax game in game number one was incredibly underrated, but really what he's giving, uh, what he's getting this player of the series for is that Gragas game in game number two. He obliterated KDF on that Gragas. Dudu had an uncharacteristically bad week, I would say overall. Not that he was like horrible, just that he really wasn't a dominant top laner like he had been in previous weeks. You know, one of the best in the entire region up until this point, but Kingen certainly was like really, really good in this series. And so really good to see him continue to step up and perform as we get closer to playoffs. He was somebody who did the same thing last year for DRX. I actually gave him some All-Pro votes in summer. I think I put him on the third team for All-Pro in summer because... Uh, he really got better as the split went on. It felt like his summer split was really the culmination of him kind of coming out of his shell, and he was a big reason why I had faith that DRX last year would make it to Worlds, and obviously, yada, yada, yada. And then, um, King and I think is kind of getting better as this split goes on as well. So it's certainly a trend that is interesting to see continue to develop, but Zekka is in a very similar boat going up into a player in Bulldog that has a very good reputation around the community right now, but Zekka was just by far the better player in this series, and he's really been that for most of the series that he's played this year so far. Again, he's going to have some bad series here and there. It's just kind of the nature of being Zekka and being a very aggressive player, but I would say that 75 to 80 percent of his series have been him just being better than the other mid laner on the other side of the map, and I think most of the time you're going to take that. Like, that's one of the best mid laners in the entire world, so Zekka continuing to show that that world's run was not a fluke, just like I said last year, it was not a fluke, but Viper was still fantastic. It's not like I'm trying to take anything away from Viper. He still is the best player on Hanwha Life Esports. Still is the player that is kind of driving them forward. The Kai'Sa, the Aphelios, he definitely likes these more late game hyperscaly, you know, ADCs that want to be more of a team fight presence, but he can be more of an early game guy. That's what he was for EDG for the most part. I talked about this a lot last year. He was really great with resources early on in games. That was actually his big selling point. And, you know, he hasn't exactly had to be that for Hanwha. He was earlier this week, and I was kind of talking him up for that. But in this series, he really didn't have to be that guy. And I think that was more of a positive overall for Hanwha. They could invest more in Azeka. They could invest some into King. And then once they got to the team fight phase, Viper and Kingen could absolutely take over the game. So good stuff for them. Grizzly definitely feels a lot more settled in now that he's playing more of the engagers, the initiators, the tanks in the jungle that I think are a little bit more easier to operate. And so everything's just kind of rolling for Hanwha Life. This was a good week. And then for KDF, kind of the opposite. This was not a very good week for them. And I think this proves that really they're not on that level yet. Hanwha Life is kind of the team to beat in the top five. The one that if you want to get into the top five, you do kind of have to take care of. And KDF really just wasn't going to be 
able to do that. They did put up a fight in game number two, certainly some interesting moments, but at the end of the day, they just weren't as good of a team, and so they don't walk away with a win here. It was a big fiesta, though, which was a lot of fun to watch. My dud of the series is going to go to Bulldog in the mid lane. He was pretty thoroughly outclassed by Zekka in this series, and, you know, I'm not going to overreact and try to say anything, not just about this series, but about this split, but looking at Bulldog's tape in full in the LCK, I honestly think I wasn't that far off uh, in the preseason from what I kind of expected Bulldog to be. I was a little bit lower on him than a lot of other analysts. In fact, I got a lot of crap in the comments section for being lower on him than other analysts. I didn't see like faker level upside in Bulldog, which I think everybody had just kind of anointed him to being. And he had a really good spring split. He was someone who definitely showed a lot of promise and a lot of signs of upside. And I absolutely still believe that the promise and signs of upside are still there to be one of the upper echelon mid laners in the league. Certainly someone that can play in the LCK for quite a long time. But to pretend like he's there right now, I just don't think is the true story. The inconsistency has been there basically the entirety of the summer split. His spring was really good, but I honestly think he's been worse in summer, which is certainly not the direction that you wanted to see him go in. I think the team has looked better around him, which is why it's more concerning to me. I think Dudu has been phenomenal. I think Jay has been really stable for this team. And while Taeyun and Jun have been kind of a weakness, they have games that are good, like they did in this series. And Bulldog has not necessarily moved past what he was in spring. Hopefully, it's just like a little bit of a sophomore slump a little blip on the radar because he's still ridiculously young. He's like 17, 18 years old at this point. So if next year he comes out and he absolutely dominates, I'm not going to be surprised. He still has the potential to be that guy. But it is worth noting that a lot of the people who are saying that he is that right now, I just don't think he is right now. I don't think he will be in summer of 2023. Could he be that in spring of 2024? Maybe, but I think that's a different conversation. And then the rest of this team was actually kind of okay. Jay was super aggressive in terms of how he wanted to play the game. Not always getting away with it. Uh, Taeyun and Jun were actually pretty good in this series. They're going to have good series every once in a while. We talked about that, but Dudu was relatively meh. Uh, he didn't really do all that much. Kingen was definitely significantly more impactful throughout this series, but KDF is all right. They still do feel like the best of the rest. The number six team and the team that will probably grab that last playoff spot, but I really don't think in their current form they're going to be able to do a lot with it unless, you know, T1 continues to struggle as much as they have. And then for Hanwha on the other side, like, they're a good team. They really are. Like, this was a team that finished fourth in spring split. Uh, not in the regular season, but they won a playoff series, like, a, a couple months ago, which is really difficult to do. I think Grizzly maybe getting acclimated to this team is going to help them overall. The flip-floppy nature of Clid definitely was both good and bad for this team, but Grizzly, I think, gives the other players on this team more of a chance to shine. And I think that could be a positive, because Viper, Zekka, King, and they're all crazy talented, and clearly they still have a lot of winning left to do in them. All right, but that is going to do it for my LCK week number five overview and analysis of all five days, all 10 series across the week up on the screen. Now you're going to see the updated standings after five weeks of action. In the first column to the right, you're going to see my updated power rankings in the second column. You're going to see how those have changed from last week to this week. Of course, any ties will just be broken alphabetically in terms of the standings. We can go over the power rankings, the risers, the followers, and all that stuff. One thing that's going to catch a lot of people's eye, there really aren't a lot of risers and followers this week. And a lot of people are probably going to be upset by that. I don't imagine these power rankings are going to be very common, but I'm not going to make a lot of changes this week, mostly because, yes, I know, T1 was miserable. And yes, they were miserable. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But it's hard for me to believe that this is who they are. Now, if they are like this again next week, you can best believe they're going to get skyrocketed down these power rankings right into a position where I think they belong after what they did this week. But... I'm not going to take four games and extrapolate that and say that that's all that they're going to be. Could they be that? Maybe. Could they also just have had a bad week, struggled to get acclimated to a new mid laner and, you know, have things work out as they continue to build things back up and become the number three team again? Yes, I think. And, and to, uh, to be honest, I'm more expecting that to happen than I would be just expecting them to completely fall apart like they did this week. So they stay there for now. I can totally see them moving down, but for now they stay there. Of course, Genji and KT are still one and two. That is a no-brainer. DK stays at four. Hanwha Life stays at five. Like I said, there really is a top five in the LCK at the current moment, and that is it. And then KDF, still the best of the rest. Not a great week, but still has shown a lot more promise over the course of this split than anybody else. DRX, though, gonna jump up to number seven. That win over T1 was really good, and while I don't think they've been perfect, they've certainly been okay 
okay, and they've shown moments of being able to win games, which is more than I can say for basically anybody in the bottom three. And bottom three is now a new group of three teams. Bro's going to stay at eight for me. Nongshim is going to move up to number nine with a win. And yes, Live Sandbox is going to drop all the way down to number 10, last place in my power rankings. They're the worst team in the LCK right now. There really is nothing else to say. I don't know why it's happening. I don't know if it will stop, but right now they're the worst team in the LCK, and I don't really see a lot of you know ways for them to just figure it out. These players are good enough, but they should have been good enough a couple of weeks ago, and it doesn't seem like any construction of this roster is going to be able to make it work. And so those are my power rankings. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. Who am I too high on? Who am I too low on? I'd love to know you guys' thoughts and feedback. Of course, it's time for player of the week and dud of the week, and my player of the week in week number five. Again, some relatively interesting choices this week, but for me, I'm going to go ahead and give it to Doran, the top laner for Gen G. He was fantastic. If you couldn't tell over the course of this video, I was really high on his performance and really happy with how he ended up doing this week. He's really made a name for himself, you know, on this Gen G team. Obviously, people knew about him before this, but I think he's really solidified himself as one of the best top laners in the world, and this week definitely proved that. He absolutely came out and dominated laning phase. He dominated team fights. He basically did everything you needed him to do, and he did it for a really good team. This team is incredibly scary when he's playing at his absolute best, and the, it, he, him playing as well as he did this week is a big reason why Gen G is so dominant. So he's going to get player of the week. Of course, players like Aiming on KT Rolster and Viper on Hanwha Life were definitely considered, but I did end up going with Doran. They're kind of the honorable mentions. And then my dud of the week, there were really only two teams that I could even consider for dud of the week. It's just about, you know, which player from which one of those teams I ended up choosing, and it's not going to be the obvious one. I'm going to go ahead and go with Willer, the jungler for Live Sandbox. Golly, he was miserable across this entire week. I can't remember a, a week that was as bad for an individual jungler as this one was. It felt like he was brutalized every single game. He had no pressure. His team was a disaster. And it's Willer. It's a good player. It's somebody who's been relatively consistent over the course of this year. So to see him struggle this much was definitely disappointing. You could give this to anybody on Sandbox. And I know everybody wants to see somebody on T1 win this award. You could give it to Owner. You could give it to Zeus. You could give it to Poby. Like, give it to any of them. I totally understand. I, I totally believe that, but I think if I'm looking at individual players, I noticed Willer's bad plays more than I noticed individually any of the others. T1 was worse, I think, as a collective, but only just barely. Live Sandbox was also pretty terrible, and so Dead of the Week for me is going to go to Willer, and Player of the Week is going to go to Doran, but... That is going to do it. If you guys enjoyed, let me know down in the comment section below. And of course, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. It lets me know you guys are enjoying the content and it helps get this video out to some more people. Uh, I will say this, a little bit of an addendum and aside, uh, I will not be covering week six on the channel. I put out a poll a couple of days ago on this channel in the community section. I'm going to be away from keyboard from the 14th to the 18th this month. And I asked you guys what you wanted me to do. You told me to focus on playoff primers for some of the other regions and make sure that I could get all of that stuff good instead of trying to force and shove all of these weekly recaps in in very condensed fashion and so I will be skipping week six I'll be back for week number seven here in the LCK so don't worry I'm still gonna be covering the LCK I'm just gonna be missing one week I will be updating the power rankings and all the player rankings everything in between and so you don't have to worry about that everything's gonna be caught up by the time we get back but just worth noting there will not be a video for the LCK next week but uh, hit subscribe anyways I don't only cover the LCK on this channel I cover all four of the major regions as well as the NACL and we're really getting close to playoff time in basically every single region so if you're interested in comprehensive overviews of everything happening in LOL Esports, this is the place for it. Hit that subscribe button and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos go live. But of course, with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.